Please join me in welcoming Valerie. Thank you so much, Patricia. I have been really just in awe of your capacity uh, in this installation and in this process. I've been saying that Patricia has been my boots on the ground, but she's also been a little more than that, for sure. And I'm just so thankful this would not have looked as amazing as it does without your vision and your eyes as well. And without all of the support of people who you don't always see, um, the preparators, uh, the registrar, um, Kenya back here who does all the lighting as well as um, security for the museum. So there, this is a camely. I call it my family, and it's always been my family, those past and present. And uh, this does feel like a really warm welcome home uh, in so many different ways. And so thank you for all of your hard work. Um, thank you, Hesse, for the, the real effort to bring this here. I really deeply appreciate it all in the administrative team. And then, of course, to all of you, it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces and to meet so many new faces. So welcome to the Camelie, as we say, and welcome to the Dirty South. As I think was just made clear in Valerie's comments, her capacity for generosity and inclusion and expansion, both within the museum and then within the field at large, has really exemplified her curatorial approach. And with that, I'd like to start thinking through how you approached the Dirty South in particular. Uh, many of you might not realize the long duration that goes into putting an exhibition of this magnitude and ambition together. And I really think of this show as one of Valerie's intellectual babies. <laughs> Granted, a baby with an unusually long gestation of <laughs> nearly five years or over five years in some capacities. Do you remember that aha moment when you began to mentally map this exhibition and how did it morph from that initial point? Well, I, I began, as Patricia so, so beautifully stated, this had a long kind of arc. And I initiated, the, the seeds of it, I should say, were, were sort of planted, visiting artist studios, um, and really recognizing how, how they were beginning to embrace their southernness. You know, I did a show with Robert Hodge, um, um, Destroy and Rebuild, uh, I did an exhibition of work by Nathaniel Donay, both who were, who were represented in this uh, presentation. Kaneem Smith, it was very clear to me that they were embracing um, certain aesthetic traditions, um, certain ideas about the South. Um, ideas that, as a youth, I think I tried to run away from. I am a native Houstonian. And uh, the South was always, to me, seen as something a little less than the North. Um, and here, among this, this new generation of artists, I started to see this willingness to embrace all things Southern, right? Um, certain modes of creating, traditions, quilting, Sanford Biggers even, uh, beginning to look at quilts. And I started to really begin to ask myself, what gave them the license, what gave them the the new swelling of pride um, to be embracing these sort of African-American traditions. I knew them and I loved them, but I didn't necessarily embrace them in, in lieu of something else that I thought were far more sophisticated. Uh, and it was the fact that they did see the beauty and the sophistication in them. And that came from the sort of explosion of new music, which was Southern hip hop that no longer wanted to be East Coast or West Coast. They wanted to be Southern. They wanted to embrace the land. They wanted to embrace the natural landscape. They wanted to embrace their communities, the shotgun shack, the architecture, where things happened that preserved their way of life, that gave them life, that restored them, the spirituality that they, they, that they grew up in the church. You know, and if they didn't grow up in the church, they grew up understanding naturalism as a way of linking 
uh, away from the physical realm and into the, the other realms that again sustain them. Um, they begin to understand their bodies and the history of their bodies from slavery to over policing, that there was some connective tissues there that they wanted to speak about. That it wasn't about running away, it was about running toward the challenges and remaking, remaking the whole scenario, putting it right out there in all of its rawness and not allowing it to be defined by struggle, but allowing it to be defined by um, a celebration, joy, um, preservation, music. Music has always chronicled all of these things and it's, it's always opened a realm. But for me, I began to see the visual parallels in all things. And so it, it made sense that the show needed to come alive. And initially, it was just really contemporary music and contemporary artists. And that was before I then made um, the departure from here to Virginia, which is a collecting museum, an encyclopedic museum. And honestly, I pitched this project in the interview just to kind of see how risk tolerant they were. <laughs> but when they said, wow, that sounds like an amazing project, we would love to have that manifest here, I knew it was the right place for me. And the only thing, well, there were two funny stories. Um, but the only thing my deputy director, who's my boss, said to me, he said, Valerie, think big. Think big. Stretch. We're right there with you. And so that, that gave me the mind to just reach and stretch. This was not an anomaly, contemporary music and contemporary art. There's always been sonic parallels. So why not dig deeper? Here, so oftentimes, when we presented work, whether it was con uh, conceptual art or any other practices, painting, we were always trying to help make those connective tissues to say contemporary art is not in this vacuum, doesn't emerge from a vacuum. It's tied to history. It's part of a trajectory of history of makers. And we often have to write about it, right, to make those connections. But here in an encyclopedic museum, I had the opportunity to put works next to one another to show artists were connected. Uh, and so that gave me that idea to really um, stretch this project uh, 100 years. So beginning in the 1920s to the 2020s. Um, so the title, The Dirty South, which was really, this is the funny uh, story. Uh, my boss, Michael, who is from uh, the UK, uh, they loved the project. I presented it. it. It was embraced enthusiastically. But he said, oh, Valerie, The Dirty South, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that is the real title that will bring people to the show. I think you should really think. And, you know, let's think about possible titles that will elucidate and elucidate. And, and I was like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really deep into the dirty sound. I'm not sure. And he goes, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go away for vacation. But when I come back, let's talk. Let's talk. I know, so, right? And so he was gone for two weeks. And I kind of waited very anxiously because I really was really married to this. This, this title just sort of encapsulated, it, it encapsulated so much for me. It told the story and I wasn't willing to let it go. And uh, when he got back, he said, let's schedule a time to, to connect. I said, sure. And um, at that point in time, he walks into the office and the first thing he does is he places a greeting card on my desk. And the greeting card said, greetings from the dirty south. <laughs> so I knew the ancestors were in it. And uh, I had warriors on the other realm. And, uh, and it, it feels that way. It felt like at every point doors opened. And then when they didn't open, uh, you know, COVID really was impactful in a lot of ways. Uh, and we lived through and are living through two pandemics, not just COVID, but the whole awareness uh, and acknowledgement of racism and how it's really, have really wrought what it's wrought in this country. There's a clear-sightedness clear about that. 
Um, and so living through that, you know, a lot of museums had to shut their doors and they did not reopen. So loans that were promised to the exhibition, you know, there were, there was, there were spontaneous and necessary changes. But you would never know that. Like you would never know that. And so again, that's when you realize that, that, that synergy that happens, that's very necessary. Everything happens as it should, so. Uh, and because of that, I think there was an, a real resonance about this project that really met people when they came back into museums. They needed to hear this and they needed to see this. I love that rich origin story and it's, I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing some of the logistical and um, psychological hurdles that you experienced during the process of bringing the show to bear. I. I really enjoyed talking with you and, and reading your catalog essay and thinking about the expansiveness of the presentation. Of course, you alluded to the fact that I feel like we're such a privileged audience to be able to experience some of these historical works in context with the contemporary works that they spawned and really um, validating that connectivity between past and present work that so often we're not able to experience in this museum. I'm also really taken with how almost playful some of your thematics are. There, so there are three thematics that really anchor this exhibition. When you initially enter the museum, you're greeted by the landscape section, which explores both the man-made and the natural uh, landscape. And then you move into Sinners and Saints, which is a section that I find particularly juicy. <laughs> it's in this section that we encounter Jason Moran's homage to the free jazz venue Slug Saloon. It's also in your catalog essay when you're writing about this section that you reference DJ Screw's time-bending remixes tied to spirituality. So I'd love for you to expand uh, for the audience around your thinking around uh, Sinners and Saints. Right, so it's a space of spiritualism and, and spirituality. And this notion that um, it's about the liminal space. You know, oftentimes when you hear people who are not academically trained, they won't talk about having visions. You know, the vision came to me. Um, the, the sound came to me, the, the voice came to me, and compelled me to do something, you know? And that living in between the physical and the spiritual worlds, in that, in that space is the liminal space. And, and in that, people dip into this notion of vision. How many people saw the movie Soul? It was a beautiful movie. It was about that liminal space, right? When people uh, are in music, if they're, when they are really um, in the zone, so to speak, they are tapping into that liminal space. So this ability to bend a note, like you can bend time, right? There's a kind of way in that circular way of living that you can, you can insert and disrupt, right? And that goes into this whole notion of transformation and how artists can utilize materials, transform them, to take things that would be trash and transform them into something completely extraordinary. And that same sonic notion of bending, is, it, it, it ties into how people deal with materiality. And so there is a spiritual connectivity to that. You know, how do you access that liminal space? And in that, you know, really that inner dimensional play, you know, to be able to see yourself in multiple spaces, that notion of simultaneity, simultaneity that happens, that can occur, that you can see yourself here and yet there, that you can see yourself from there, looking back, right? And that gives you a certain kind of vision, an understanding of your place in the world, an understanding of how the world is. And the ability to articulate that is quite extraordinary. Um, and so I think that's really at play. And, and, and this notion of releasing catharsis, which happens whether you're in a church on Sunday morning and receiving the spirit, right? 
or it could happen, you know, when you get to the, at the bottom of a bottle, you know, you can get to that liminal space. You know, we can alter how we get to that liminal space, but all roads, whether it's through, you know, sort of religious release or whether it's through uh, a, a more profane way of moving through the world, we could still get to that same space. And so, hence the sinners and saints notion, you know. Your ability to frame sinners and, spa sinners and saints and spirituality beyond religion in a conventional sense, I think really speaks to your curatorial voice and vision that emphasizes both and hybridity. And this really expansive and generous understanding of what can constitute um, various thematics. And I think that that applies really aptly to the section in which we currently find ourselves, which is also the third section of the exhibition, centering around the black body or black corporality. As many of you might notice when you look around, there are some figurative works that very clearly reference the body, but then there are also some things many of you might find surprising. There are a number of uh, incredibly important historical abstract works, contemporary works that might metaphorically or illusionarily reference the body, but they're not as literal. Can you speak to how you decided to frame what might constitute the black body? Absolutely. You know, there there's points like if you turn and look at the Aster Gate Shoe Shine, you know, a space where the expectation of black bodies would exist, right? Or Terry Atkins Columbia, this this large black um, condo piece, which was about black music and the distribution of black music. Um, you also have, of course, Deborah Roberts, which is a figurative collage. Bethany Collins series of um, sort of like black um, monographs. They're, they're really quite beautiful because they are ads that were taken out in the aftermath of emancipation in which people were looking for their relatives. A lot of times, um, these are histories that are little known. You know, we're taught that emancipation happened and, you know, the slaves are freed and, you know, they began this, this other life. But it wasn't like you just began life. You had to reconstitute your life, mm -hmm. right? You had children sold away from you. You had husbands and spouses, wives sold away from you. You, you were looking for people. And that's a little known history that no one knows about. It wasn't like you just forgot like some animal. So, you know, these are things, the reference of Jamal Cyrus's uh, denim quilt references to civil rights and how they wore overalls to connect with the people who were working the land. But this is an FBI document with redacted text. So these are histories, these are histories in which the black body has endured and in many cases we continue to endure. Um, but it's not just about struggle, it's also so, it's about celebration, it's about preserving. You know, black body can, is the repository of tradition and a generator of joy and creative expression. So it's not to affix the black body in trauma and struggle, but to understand the full range and complexity of the journey. And I think that is really uh, brought to full, uh, to bear in its fullest in Arthur J. Foe's uh, piece, Love is the Message, the Message of his Death. Yeah. I think that's a really important note to continue to drill on, and it's something that we've talked a lot about internally at CAM, that one of the predicating considerations of this exhibition is not to flatten the experience of black Southerners into specifically linking to trauma, while of course still acknowledging the centuries long and continuing racial injustices that have mired this region, while still honoring the joy, the innovation, the experimentation, and the resilience that similarly characterizes many artists in this region. And in continuing to think about this both and model, and as opposed to an either or, I, I've been taken by your framing and your inclusion of artists who are often termed outsider or visionary artists 
and your casting of them as um, what you at present term uh, intuitive intellectuals. So oftentimes when we bring in folk artists or vernacular artists or outsider artists, we're stripping away the sort of intellectual dimension that we bring to bear. And, and it's just completely wrong. We give over that to artists who are academically trained. And you don't have to be academically trained to have an intellectual rigor. Right? And so that is the reason why uh, these artists are part of the holistic narrative. And uh, so many artists, uh, uh, Jack Whitten here, uh, Beverly Buchanan, are referencing uh, Sam Gilliam in that abstract painting, Chaser's Purple, is referencing African American quilts. So a lot of African American Southern artists are really pulling on the things that they grew up with. And you don't have to be, you know, I mean, the reality is if you are black and from this country, chances are no matter where you are, you're only one, two, three generations removed from the South. So you're constantly referencing upon the things that you know, the first things that you see are in your home, whether that's an African-American quilt, whether it's some other type of decorative or craft-oriented uh, piece, but it's something that has left an indelible impression. And artists will oftentimes return to that. So it is to really reassert uh, these artists as part of that overall narrative, um, that they're not disconnected. Uh, and that we, I mean, it's a it's a poor substitute to call them intuitive intellectuals, but I mean, I'm, I'm grappling with that language right now, but that's as close as I can get to it, uh, because I do want to always affix that back into the narrative and to really think through, you know, what has that tradition brought to this country? Oftentimes we look to Europe for our uh, quest in understanding modernism. But modernism, its origins happen in our own backyard as well. And if we can celebrate jazz as the original American art form, why wouldn't we celebrate you know, uh, other art productions coming out of the African American South? Why wouldn't we celebrate quilts as an original American art form? It has all the same hallmarks as jazz. So what would be the visual parallel to that? And why wouldn't we not weave it into the fabric of understanding, you know, American, if we have an American expression, why would that not be one tributary toward modernism? That's been such a historically overlooked trajectory, and I think that that's also one of the central arguments this exhibition is making, and many who might not work in the field uh, perhaps might not consider the fact that exhibitions are constantly making arguments and advocating for certain theses, whether it's more overt or subtle, even if just the underlying principle that an artist's work is significant and urgent and deserving of the space that it's been given. So I think what you're honing in on, Valerie, even though you're not overtly um, listing it in didactic materials or, or taking that approach, is really such a significant legacy of this exhibition. And you've also referenced the connection points between some of these intuitive intellectuals and contemporary or um, la later generations of academically trained artists. And as I continue to think about connections in many of these artists' work, something that I was so taken as I continued to experience this exhibition and to spend more time with the work and to research the artists was this enormous web of connection that links so many of the artists in this exhibition. I actually had fantasies of creating a massive mind map, thinking about mentor and mentee relationships, artists from the same hometown, artists who went to the same music venues, artists who were family, artists who uh, shared various points of inspiration. And actually, we're sitting close to one of my favorite moments of that type of conversation. To my far right, your left, is this large circular painting entitled Columbia by the artist Terry Atkins. And it's his quiet homage to the artist, excuse me, to the blues singer, Bessie Smith. And it's actually painted with 160 layers of enamel, enamel paint to reference the number of records that she released on Columbia Records. And then to his right 
is this remarkable experimental work by Jack Whitten that might look like a mosaic, but it's a glass mosaic, but it's actually composed of paint that he has poured into molds. So it's little acrylic um, elements to form the larger mosaic. And this is his homage to Terry Atkins. So it all comes full circle. And I was curious, Valerie, which moment, if there's another moment of intersection that really excites you in the show? Oh my gosh, there are too many. Um, there's, if you, if there's something you've talked about a lot, if you can't think of anything that I'd love for you to share. Oh, well, you can tell me what I've talked Bessemer. about. <laughs> Bessemer, oh Alabama. My gosh, that's a Thank you, Patricia. Yes. Uh, <laughs> see, that's why this is a conversation. Um, Yes, the triangulation. You know, Jack Whitten, Thornton Dial, and Sun Ra, all out of Bessemer, Alabama. Something about the pipe shop, leaving the pipe shop. But, you know, I, I think, I, and thank you, I have used that analogy over and over and over again, or that those facts over and over again, to really pinpoint this idea of the sonic, you know, the the intellectual, the intuitive intellectual, and the academically trained artists, that they all can come from this little patch of land um, that has informed them a different, almost of the same generation. Um, Sun Ra being a little older, um, well, not really. They're, they're all of about the same generation. So there is something that you can get that kind of uh, sensibility all out of one space. Uh, uh, yes, out of the store. Thank you. Uh, see, she's sitting on the front seat. You get on, get on up there. Um, so you know that you can get that out of out of one particular um, place. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. Absolutely. So I'd love to turn to thinking about connections that artists share in terms of their process and strategies as they approach their work. There are, you've referenced this um, a little bit earlier, but there are countless examples of inventive use of materials that really exemplifies the artists in this exhibition. And in your catalog essay, you use a term that I absolutely adore, willful misuse of material. And I think of several examples of really inventive use, whether it's Rita Mae Petway's use of scraps to compose her quilt, upstairs or around the corner you'll have to take a look right after this talk oh, there's yes. Philandis's use of shoestrings and also Robert Hodge's use of flyers and posters that he accumulated from the third ward to constitute the raw materials of his painting uh, Burt Williams tap dance so I would love for you if possible to tease out this willful misuse of material and for you how it exemplifies a Southern sensibility. Yeah, I had a wonderful conversation with Fred Moten, who's also a contributor to the catalog, and I always saw it as this notion of, of, of transforming, this idea of utilizing uh, every uh, bit of scrap to transform something. And Fred came up with something that was so brilliant, it was so subtle, and I don't know how I didn't think of it. Um, uh, but he said it was a refusal to see the nothingness in something. The refusal to see the nothingness in something. And I thought that was so beautiful because it is that. It is about taking something that was not meant uh, to be used in a certain way uh, that may be discarded and, and reconstituting it, giving it life. Well, not just giving it life, which was my sense of it, giving it life, but for Fred to say, acknowledging the life that exists in it and allowing it to be something else, making it, in many cases, be something else. Um, that beautiful uh, Mildred Thompson, you know, just made of pieces of scrapped wood found and, uh, and, and to really see the sheer potential in what that is. To take discarded slats of wood and to recognize the mark making as that, as, as a painter's brush and to constitute it as a painting, to, to form it as something that it was never meant to be. You know, uh, you know Thornton Dial, 
to take the scraps from the pipe shop, from the, the cast-offs, and to make it something, right? it, it, to formulate it into something, to conceive it as something, to use it in a way that it was never meant to be used. And it's the same way as sort of bending that note, right? To transform something just through sheer molding and conceiving and molding and conceiving and molding. I find this strategy so liberating because you can extrapolate out the potential ramifications because for me, many of these artists are saying that no material, no symbol, no history has to be static, and that they have agency in the recasting a larger narrative. Um, I'm, I've also been thinking about another shared strategy. You mentioned some of that, uh, the willful misuse of an instrument or a note in addition to material kind of links the sonic and visual artists in this exhibition. And the same can be said for improvisation. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to some examples of how this strategy is used by both sonic and visual artists? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was also thinking about Ornette Coleman and how he would utilize even plastic yes. uh, musical instruments to, to create sound and experimentation with sound. Uh, but, you know, you have that with uh, people like, you know, pulp makers, you know, made headway. Um, but you have that kind of notion of how you utilize materials <clears throat> that may not have been originally uh, slated for uh, its particular purpose. And, and yeah, I think, I think Ornette Coleman, that's the closest I can get to the, the sort of uh, sonic parallels to that. Um, you'll also have Sun Ra. I mean, if you look at that snippet of uh, video that's present in the Cabinet of, uh, of Wonder, you'll see that it's almost like a bike helmet he has on his head, you know, that he's, all of his orchestra, you know, they would have these tunics, but then they would also adorn themselves um, with other objects to, to feel and look otherworldly, garland, um, you know, so it, it would be those sort of elements in that. And then, of course, you know, the, the DJ screw and the sort of cut and paste and slowing down of things. Um, to kind of alter perception of sounds as well. So there, there are a lot of sonic parallels to it. Um, Absolutely. I had the immense pleasure of supporting Valerie during the final years of her tenure here at CAM, and her exhibitions and her approach really stretched my understanding of what could constitute a painting, what could constitute performance, what can constitute sound. And I think that the implications of that are really evident for me, particularly in this exhibition. When you walk through the space, as soon as we activate the various sonic elements following this talk, there are gonna be, of course, various pieces or um, videos that have an element that you could physically hear but there are also so many objects that have latent or embodied or performative energy encapsulated within them. We can all look to Radcliffe Bailey's monumental sculpture containing brass elements, excuse me, instruments that he salvaged from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. There are so many other examples you can look to in the uh, Cabinet of Wonders, including, or you mentioned Ornette Coleman, saxophone that you're able to experience and imagine it coming to life filled with music. Which, why are you drawn to, or are you, I'm sure you are, but why are you drawn to objects that have this latent performative element and which ones excite you in particular? Oh, I think because it, it still um, pulsates with the energy. That's, that's it for me. And, and even imagined sound, you know, imagined motion action. Um, Slug Saloon is really wonderful in that respect because Jason has activated that piece and hopefully will come and activate it here. But it's something about the, the reverb, the residual, you know, energy that's retained on that stage um, that is that subtle, it's subtle. But you feel it, you know. Uh, it makes uh, objects come alive in ways um, that they ordinarily 
would not come alive. And there is an emotive quality to the work. And it's hard to always put your finger on it, but it's something you're just absolutely drawn to. So whether it is something that truly does get activated or something that we could only imagine a sort of action that happens upon it, 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 it has that sort, of, um, that sort of energy that kind of comes from it, that emanates from it, that I think keeps you engaged. It's kind of like a visual earworm, or a, what would be the equivalent of an earworm? Something of that nature, sort of echo. I forget the technical name for it, but when you see something and you close your eyes and it, that image reverbs within your, your just sort of inner, inner sight. It stays there. You also tell a great story about the histories of embedded sonic energy in quilt making. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing that story? Or oftentimes, especially with G-Spin, and it's well documented, historically, People would piece alone, of course, but then when they would come to quilt, they would come to quilt together. And oftentimes uh, you would speak over the quilt, um, people would sing because it was an event. You would come together as a community and, and do that. And it is something about, you know, it, 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 it taps again into that liminal space, this notion of transference too, that you can take the intangible, that then intangible sometimes gets embedded in that static object. And so that object becomes imbued with some sort of you know, performative energy that you can feel. You know? uh, and so quilts oftentimes have that sensibility to them. And in thinking about the histories that an object might have in the future, I've been thinking a lot about the potential impact this exhibition will have in its lasting legacy. Of course, we've discussed one of the central theses about the argument that black Southern artists have contributed to the trajectory of modernism and the development of modernism in the United States. And I know that you've also crafted a really important legacy within the confines of the, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in terms of acquisitions and supporting many of these artists. Um, I know one example, for instance, is this Deborah Roberts collage, who, as a side note, Deborah, who's an Austin-based artist, will be in conversation with Kaneem Smith here at the CAM a little bit later during the run of this exhibition. So please stay tuned for that. I would love to hear how you approach your responsibility around acquisitions and what opens up for you in terms of the impact of of acquisitions as opposed to simply exhibitions? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important that uh, these exhibitions... <laughs> it's just... uh, thank you. <laughs> and it's Mary Lou, everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, it, um, I mean, I think um, creating or crafting exhibitions uh, is vitally important. Having the accompany catalogs are vitally important. But also having works exist in museums as acquisitions, that they, they stay in museums to constantly push and shift and open the narratives, that is essential. And it's something that I did not have the opportunity here because we're a non-collecting museum, but it is vitally important that it happens in Richmond, Virginia, or any other <laughs> museum. Um, I, I think Richmond's going to be my last thought, honestly, but, um, but it's vitally important that uh, those shifts actually remain affixed and that are not these sort of temporal moments in museums. Uh, I take that very, very seriously, and it's an opportunity for me to support the artists that have championed all along. Uh, by acquiring their works and having them really be a part of a larger narrative. And with respect to this exhibition, correct me if I'm wrong, but one third of the works on view are in the collection of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Well, in its accurate? original iteration, a fourth of the works that were presented were in, that were actually acquired for the museum. So you will see a lot of those acquisitions as you read um, through the uh, notes, uh, Mildred Thompson. Uh, some works, of course, didn't travel 
um, but uh, Deborah Roberts. Um, so there are several works we have acquired. We did not acquire Love is the Message, The Message is Death, because that edition was sold out. Uh, but we did acquire A Kingdom Cometh by uh, Anki Jaifa, which is an equally striking work of art, uh, moving image. Um, trying to mentally go through the Bill trailers that are on view. The Thornton Dial. The Thornton Dial. Uh, we, uh, the Rita Med Petway, they are part of a larger acquisition uh, we did with a gift purchase exchange with the Souls Grundy Foundation. We acquired 14 quotes from G-Spin, which we are constantly rotating in our minimalist gallery. Uh, beautiful conversation with that. Um, six Thornton Dow sculptures, uh, two paintings and three works on paper, work by Jimmy Suddeth, Lonnie Holly, um, Ronald Lockett, um, uh, not thinking of all of the works, uh, Most Tolliver we've acquired, um, Dr. Regina Perry, uh, a foremost scholar on uh, art from the African American South, um, actually has been a huge benefactor, a completely generous um, uh, donor, and has gifted us a whole cache of works by Renee Stout, uh, one of which you see on view. We have several other uh, iconic works by that artist, uh, along with countless works by Ruth McCrane, who is uh, from here, from Houston, Texas, uh, Johnny Banks, uh, oh my gosh, too many artists to name. Uh, but all that to say is that our collection has grown. We've got uh, several paintings by Purvis Young now in our collection. Uh, it has been remarkable, just the sheer explosion of works we've been able to acquire, but then works that have been gifted to us in, in the wake of that. I remember talking to you as soon as, or not long after you made the transition from CAM to Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and you were like, I'm going on a shopping spree. <laughs> and it's not with my credit card. <laughs> And I'm changing the canon. Yes. I think it's so remarkable how you've been able to use your platform. That's something that when I went to visit the show in Richmond, I was, of course, not only taken by the exhibition, but when I went to visit your permanent galleries, I mean, you mentioned some of the rehangs that you've been able to achieve, but there was the incredible Melvin Edwards barbed wire piece in conversation yes. with Sola Witt sculpture in conversation with the G's Ben Quilt. And it gives me chills thinking about how expansive and juicy and um, really stunning and poignant these new conversations you're able to bring into Richmond are for the longevity and for posterity. Oh yeah, we, I, I'm, I'm having a great time. I love shopping with other people's money. <laughs> and uh, one of the first um, um, fairs that I went to in, in the capacity of being the uh, Sydney and Francis Lewis curator was to freeze and I arrived in August, and we went in October, and I saw an amazing new piece. And uh, Alex Narges, who is the director, we were walking through, and I said, oh, that's a beautiful Nick Cave. I said, but I'm not sure that would be the one. And he said, it's not an either or, Valerie. It's not either or. And I thought, oh, I'm with him. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be taking that. Wrap it up. <laughs> so, it has really been remarkable. I mean, there is a largesse there, but there is also a responsibility, you know, to really still uh, be very thoughtful in what comes into the collection because it is about making those connections. And right now there's, you know, um, uh, Gustin, Philip Gustin, and flanking him is a beautiful work by Trenton Doyle Bancroft. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the funny. other side, Gary Simmons. And so that conversation, um, Annabeth Rose in my last project here uh, in conversation with Elizabeth Murray. And so it, it's just really the, you know, Virginia Jaramillo uh, in conversation with, uh, you know, Rasheed Johnson. And uh, those cross generational uh, conversations continue. And they're a hallmark of my exhibitions, but they're now a hallmark of this, you know, beautiful ability to to kind of have these things exist in space on a more permanent basis. The JFA film that you mentioned, Love is the Message, the Message is Death. You mentioned earlier that for you, this piece really encapsulates a spectrum 
of emotions and experiences, pain, joy, trauma, love, music, expression. And you also very intentionally wanted this to be the last experience that viewers encounter as they uh, pass through the exhibition. Would you speak to that decision? Oh, for so many reasons. Uh, I mean, I feel that as you walk through the exhibition, you are a bit on a journey. And it's a journey that I've crafted with artists at the core. Uh, but it is something about that JFA that allows, through moving image, it, it, it has a different kind of impact. But it allows the compression of that journey uh, to be seen and felt. And that's why I wanted it to be positioned toward the very end. Um, it's like that, that, uh, that sensibility, something that stays with you. Because it is about creating a sense of, um, or, or opening, hoping that there is a space for empathy. That, that is the most poignant way of saying it even though it may feel harsh. I hope it, and it's all, there's nothing, there's no artifice in that piece. They're all real pieces, whether it was, I mean, artifice in terms of some of the commercial um, uh, films that he's excerpted from, um, early uh, depictions of black bodies in film, um, that's artifice. But I hope that as people see it and they walk away, they understand what that journey has been and that there is a sense of empathy that emerges from that uh, because it's so sorely needed. You know, I think we've become so closed and, and, and there's a lack of civility now more than ever. Um, but we have to be open to each other's journey. And this is but one narrative, but it is a narrative that feeds into the larger American story. In the South, you would not have America if you did not have the South. You would not have America if you did not have black people here in this country. And you have to recognize that. And that's what this is about. Well, it's now your turn. Who would like to start with any burning question you might have for Valerie? Yes, please. Well, I might have a question. Second round, then we'll go to the third row. Yes. Hi, welcome. I'm Thank you, Delita. Um, Anne actually texted me. She wants me to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, is Anne even here? <laughs> How's she going to ask her a question if she's not even here? Wow. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She says the downstairs showcase so many important pieces, recent and archival. I've never seen an Augusta salvage game that small. How and where did you acquire or find the piece? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael Rosenfeld. Actually, Augusta Savage did um, several of those works, and some of them were done uh, cast smaller uh, as additions. Um, so that's where it comes from. Yes. 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 That's okay. <laughs> um, the adjective dirty has many meanings, and so I wonder if there was one in particular or many that you used when you brought your play. Well, it's not just dirty, it's the dirty south. So let's not put dirty by itself. Um, so the dirty south, of course, it gets codified in the contemporary realm by southern hip hop artists, right? And it's meant to reference the history of the south. Okay, um, but Dirty South has also existed as an endearing, a term of endearment, and they're all terms, let me just say, it's a term of endearment, okay? Um, but it's also been as a term of endearment to recognize that the South is an agrarian society. It is born and raised from the dust and the dirt, okay? So it is about that. But in, in terms of hip hop, it is meant to recognize the whole history of the South, which is again tied to the land. Uh -huh. Yes, okay, we'll start with the second row then. Hi, my name is Maya, and when you're talking about the two intellectuals, I wanted to know if there was a desire to have an artist. Who are trying to get started in the process, like either creating a piece or 
education or um, being able to find platforms? I mean, that, that's, you know, that's the plight of all artists, whether they're academically trained or not, is how to find their way into spaces that, that will support and sustain their work. Um, I think first you develop your own community of artists that help to sustain you and to sustain your practice. People that you can, you know, bounce back and forth with. You know, do the work and then, you know, just place yourself in spaces where you're exposed. You know, sometimes, you know, I would say the sort of art ecology, you know, has somehow gotten disrupted. There used to be spaces where you could have, um, you know, uh, artist-run spaces, you know, not-for-profit organizations, and, you know, you know, school and university galleries, and then commercial galleries, and the museums. There used to be an ecology of spaces that you could kind of begin to hone your craft and be shown and featured, and each would reverb with another. And that's gotten disrupted over the past 20, 30 years. Um, so it really is trying to find those spaces again. I mean, Houston is amazing because you do have so many different venues. You have diverse works. You have Lawndale. You have HMAC. You have all of these spaces. There are a lot of cities that don't even have that, you know? So find your community and allow, and, and, and allow yourself to be mentored. You know, find someone who is going to serve as a mentor to you. Um, and, and really allow your practice to start growing. And worry less about how to be exposed and worry more about how to hone your craft because that will come. And then, you know, Jack Whitten, you know, uh, Barclay Hendricks, these people had all the inventory of their works because no one was looking at it. So be prepared. It's a long haul. Nothing is instantaneous. And if it is, be careful. Yeah. Yes. 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 Great advice. We have time for one more question. Okay. Yes. You know, but you mentioned that this exhibit is so expensive. Going back to the year, how do you even approach curate an exhibit like this? I mean, do you sit and think of different themes that you talk about as you know, it's kind of like approaching a painting? And then were there any pieces? That's a great question. You know, I mean, I think you start with the things that the constellation in your brain. You know, it starts with a constellation. You know, just like that Palmer Hayden, the dreamer piece. You know, I am dreaming of a constellation. What really kind of hones in this space? That triangulation of Sun Ra and Jack Whitten and Thornton Dial, and then you build outward, right? And, yeah, I don't know if there was anything that surprised me. I think what, if anything, is how, how harmonious works were across generations and across time. I mean, I would have never guessed Michi Meko and Alma Thomas would have the conversations mm -hmm. that they're having. They're like, you know, they're like two-part harmony up there. <laughs> They're loving each other. And it's like that, that came out of nowhere. I mean, I knew I wanted them in the exhibition, but I did not, I didn't, I did not, um, it didn't hit to me until they were in the space together. It was like, you know, yeah, I thought of that. I knew that. <laughs> I didn't know that. It's always a surprise because when things come together, you really don't know if they're going to like each other, if they're, you know, they're, they are like, you know, they're alive. You know, the artwork is alive, so it, it really is going to let me know, no, please, do not put me next to them. I don't like that, you know, or I love that girl, put me right there, that's my cousin, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, and it's always an experiment. You never know. You have these ideas, but you don't know what they, what they will, what kind of life they'll take on. They live beyond you, you know? Um, so the, there were several, thematic ideas, right? But it was allowing the art to tell me where it wanted to be. And then those things got whittled down to these very larger sort of orbs uh, of existence.
Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but I think You're going to deny Sarah Trotty? I'm giving the hand Sarah signals. Trotty? Okay, one I'll more. I'll let Felice override. One okay. More. Val overrides. <laughs> I think that'd be a good one. No, I'm kidding. Right, right. <laughs> no. First of all, I do want to add that I'm so happy to see you guys home. But I think one of the I think it I, I think it was it was a real mix of it all. Right? It was it was suddenly seeing something that was right in front of me with a new lens and new eyes. And loving the skin, loving the skin you're in, loving where you're from, you know, um, embracing all of that, and knowing that you're standing in your power when you acknowledge your origin, right? You sit in your your space of gravitational center, and if you do that, then you're almost immovable, right? You're, you're it's a superpower, and we need to sit in our power. We need to sit. We need to we need to be restored. I think that's why a lot of artists, Jack Whitten's notes from the woodshed, always let you know that he was looking for his gravitational center. He always was acknowledging his gravitational center. And uh, all artists are doing that. All all people artists are just people like you and me. They just have a different profession. We're all looking for our gravitational center. And so that's really what it was about. It, it, it was for me acknowledging and embracing and loving, you know, the skin of it. So that's it. Wow. Great conclusion. <laughs>